If you're new here, welcome. Um, I'm so happy and grateful to have you here on my channel. Like I said, my name is Hillary, and if you could, um, if you want to see more of my content, if you could hit the bell notification, it will let you know when I upload new videos, so that you can see the rest of my videos and see my channel. Okay, so let's just get right into the story because this story is crazy. So I'm gonna read to you guys um, what happened and about the story, like I said, and then give you guys my predictions after. So the story is about the Sauter family. So. Fayetteville was and is a small town with a main street that doesn't run longer than 100 yards. On Christmas Eve in 1945, George and Jenny Sauter and nine of their 10 kids went to sleep. One of their kids was in the army. And around 1 a.m., a fire broke out in the house. George and Jenny and four of their kids escaped, but their other five kids were never to be seen again. Oh my God. So the energy in this is just absolutely, it's so strong and it's so intense. Even though it happened in 1945, it's just, it's crazy. I had to do this one. It's bonkers. So George had tried to save the, save the kids by breaking a window, um, to re-enter the house. And he went through all of the rooms and he could not see anything through all the smoke and fire. He couldn't see the children. Two-year-old Sylvia, 17-year-old's Marion and their two sons, 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr., were safe outside with Jenny. He couldn't get to the others in the house because of the smoke and fire, and their names were Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty. So the dad, George, tried to go upstairs um and go to the rooms with a ladder that they usually had leaning against the house, but the ladder was actually missing and it, the ladder wasn't there. So then he tried to drive one of his two coal trucks and stand on one of the trucks hoping to get inside a window, but when he went to go use them to drive them up to the house, both of them were not working. He also tried to scoop water out of a barrel and put it on the flames and uh, clearly that didn't work. The flames were just huge and the fire was roaring at this point. So there was nothing that he could do. Um, so sad. Mary and the daughter sprinted to a neighbor's home and called the Fayetteville Pol uh, Fire Department, but she didn't get a response. Like, things back then, you guys, were a lot different than they are now, but the fact that they didn't get a response is just crazy. Um, the Fayetteville police... Um, were also called and they also didn't get a response from them. The neighbor then drove to town and talked to the fire chief, um, who was named, uh, his last name was Morris. Um, he initiated a fire alarm or also called a phone tree back then is what they would call them. It's a system where a firefighter phones another one and that one phones another one and then they all get together and go to the fire. Uh, the departments were only 2.5 miles, the fire department was like 2.5 miles away from the house and the crew didn't even arrive to the, to the place, to the house until 8 a.m. You guys, that is absolutely insane. Oh my God. So the house was then obviously by then a smoking pile of ashes. So they were too late. This is so sad. This is horrible. Um, George and Jenny assumed that the five the five children were dead. But the brief search of the grounds and on Christmas Day turned up no remains. So they found nothing in the ashes, none of the kids' bones. Chief Morris said that the flames were hot enough to cremate the bodies. And that's why they couldn't find anything. Um, and they also attributed the fire to faulty wiring in the house. George covered the basement with five feet of dirt, um, hoping that the site would become a memorial for his children. The deaths were then attributed to the cause of suffocation from flame, from smoke. But the, the Sodders didn't even believe this. They believed that their children were still alive because, to be honest, you guys, most people didn't believe that the children were in the fire. Um, and George was... A smart and ambitious guy, um, he worked on the railroads, carrying water supplies to laborers. 
and he then launched his own trucking company and it was a company that would haul coal so he was really well known in the community and he was well respected he also had strong opinions about a lot of things like politics apparently but he was well respected so he was not just uh, punished for this at all and he would often talk about everything like he was he was very outspoken but people found it weird that he would not speak about his youth he would not talk about his youth at all so a stranger appeared at their home a few months before the fire asking George about um, some hauling work if he could work for him he then went to the back of the house wandered to the back of their house and seen two separate fuse boxes and said these were his exact words these are going to cause a fire someday that's what this guy said you guys those are his exact words and then another man had tried to sell the family life insurance a few months before the fire apparently or only a couple months and he became very uh frustrated and angry when george declined paying for life insurance and then this guy also said in his own words your house will go up in flames and so will your children so i don't know um the older solder sons also noticed something peculiar just before christmas as well they noticed a man parked along the u.s highway 21 and he was watching the younger children walk home from school playing and laughing and watching them go home creepy uh There was also a strange phone call, Xmas Eve, um, and Jenny answered the phone, and it was an unfamiliar woman's voice, and the woman was just laughing. So this was Christmas Eve, when everything happened, before the fire happened, and they were opening gifts, is what I'm seeing in my visions anyways, and then the phone rang, the mom answered, and it was some weird lady's voice just laughing. And then Jenny said, you have the wrong number, and she hung up. Jenny then noticed uh, when she went downstairs um that the downstairs lights were still on and the curtains were open and the front door was also unlocked which is really unusual because usually it was um marion's job the daughter to and she always did it to do all these things um and then she saw marion sleeping at the couch and assumed that she just forgot to do it because it was christmas eve all the excitement and stuff and they were opening presents so she went to bed and didn't think anything of it jenny um then conducted a private experiment after the fire with animal bones because she didn't believe that her children had died in the fire. And she wanted to see if the fire would um, cremate them, like the fire chief had said about her children. Um, She did this plenty of times, and every single time the, the bones were left with, like the bones were still there, and they didn't all burn to ash. So um also various household appliances still had been found after the fire so she was kind of assuming that if household appliances didn't completely burn then not all of her five children's bones would completely turn to ash so she um found these also found these appliances in the basement and they were also some of them were identifiable so you could also tell what they were so she, she really just didn't believe that her kids were gone and she felt inside, and so did the dad, that her children were still alive. Um, she was also told told by a um, crematorium that the, bones re- that the bones still remain after bodies are even burned for two hours at 2,000 degrees. And the solder's house was, o- was destroyed in only 45 minutes. So, yeah, none of that, nothing, none of the, nothing was making sense to them. Um, a phone repair man also told the solders that the lines appeared to have been cut and not burned. A waitress also claimed that she seen the children the morning after the fire, 50 miles away from Fayetteville, and she was a waitress working at um, a place that was like a, t- a tourist stop, and she said she had seen them and served them breakfast. So, I know there was also a few sightings from people. Um, some of them were probably not real, but I am picking up with my gifts that a couple, that was that lady was not lying. And I am getting that there was also other people who had seen these children as well. Um, like driving away with these, with men that I'm, well, you know more when I get to the predictions. So, 
Um, let's just get into my predictions now, you guys, and what I got about this case, all right? So, right away, I picked up a jealous and revengeful, angry energy um, directed at the father around this this time, like the year 1945. And I feel like this was because of his position and how successful he was and the money he had, that there was a lot of men that were jealous of his life. And I am getting, picking up that some of these men, at least two of these men were Italian. And I'm picking up that George had some like business deals with these men. And also I believe there is one of them, one of them that he owed money to. And so that's where this anger is coming from in regards to this one Italian male that I'm picking up that he was owed money and he was sick of George not paying him the money. And, um, George just wasn't cooperating with these men. Okay. And I feel like these men are dangerous. They aren't the safest men to be kind of playing with. Um, so I did pick up that the, this was premeditated and that the kids, uh, were actually kidnapped. I am not getting from my spirit guides that the kids were burned in this fire. Okay. Um, the fire was just a distraction um, to distract the parents and distract everyone in the neighborhood away from them kidnapping the children. So what I'm actually seeing is that the guy that was watching, that the older boy seen watching, was used trying to find how that was going to work, how they were going to get into the house. And I feel like they went through the back of the house. I feel like they started the fire, they cut the wires... And I feel like they started the fire and then they, when the fire was starting, they, I, I'm getting that they went upstairs into the children's bedrooms and told them that what I'm seeing is they were like, be quiet, be quiet. We're, don't worry. We're here to save you. We're the firemen. That's what they told these children. And then they sort of went out the back of the house and I'm seeing them put them, I, there was at least three or four men that were there that were getting the children, but I think only one or two men went into the house. And they brought them out and I'm seeing them drive away with these children in trucks and they told these kids that they were going to save, they were saving them from the fire and they were saying things like, um, your parents, they're fine, don't worry, they're, they're at the fire station, that's where we're bringing you guys to now or something along those lines, like we're taking you to your parents. So that's where the children thought that's where they were going. And they were, you know, telling them to be quiet and not scream and not say anything because they were there to help them. Um, so I feel like the, the fire thing was also a way for them to get the kids to be quiet and just a way for them to sort of get the kids out of the house, if that makes sense. Um, so I do feel like the kids were sold and scattered around different places and they were sold to like farmers and picking up like people that would use them for work, um, to make money. Because this was sort of the way that these men were getting their money back from their father was they were going to use their kids to work and make money from their children. Because I'm getting this energy like if you're not going to give us our money, it's too late. We're going to get our money some way, one way or another, and your kids and your family are going to pay for this. So it's not that I feel like the kids are being abused. I actually don't think that they were being abused or that they were being beaten or anything like that. But they were sold and they were separated um, and told not to say anything because if they did say something that these men were going to kill them and that's why they never said anything. It's, it's so, so sad. It's disgusting. Um, I just can't believe that none of them spoke up. They believed everything that these men were feeding to them. They were completely brainwashed, but I do see, especially one of the young girls working on a farm and like, she's like cutting crops and stuff. And that's why I see in my third eye. So I, and the older boy, Lewis, I'm picking up, he actually did try to reach out to his parents. And I am unfortunately getting that they found out and that he was punished for that. I feel like he was killed because he spoke up and said something. And that scared his other siblings as well. So they were like, wow, we're really not saying anything. Like they wanted to contact their parents, they missed them, but they just weren't going to because they were scared shitless. And back then there was no cell phones, like there wasn't, it wasn't easy to get a hold of people and they didn't even really know, they were really young, I believe Lewis was only 14, so he kind of understood, he stood a lot more, than, understood a lot more than the younger kids understood, but he was, um, he didn't even really know where they went, like they didn't even tell them where they were bringing them, but they drove pretty far away, it, it's, yeah, they are nowhere near where they grew up or anything, so... 
they definitely lived in fear. I wrote that down in meditation. They lived in fear of these men. And, you know, the men would watch them and check up on them and make sure they weren't opening their mouth and that type of thing is what I'm picking up. Um, they were bribed to cooperate a lot. Um, but I also feel like they, like, I feel like they weren't, they were also kind of bribed where they were, they weren't given the worst lives. Yes, they were made to work hard and make money, but I'm honestly getting that they, they weren't, they were like treated okay. They weren't treated horrible. And that was why also they were, you know, they didn't have the feeling to want to leave all the time is because they were being treated okay. If that, I know that sounds really bad. Like, yes, they still want to go back to their parents, but they weren't being like abused or tortured or anything like that. Thank God. Um, they were just made to work on farms and make money for these men that their father couldn't pay to these men. So, yeah. Um, I do feel like the Lewis kid wrote to that. I feel like I'm seeing like a picture of him being sent in the mail um, to his parents so that they could sort, sort of, I guess, um, know that he was okay. They wanted to show him, you know, we're okay and I'm okay, even though he didn't really know if his siblings were okay or not because they were separated. He wanted to show them that he was okay, but it didn't end up well. Yeah, you guys, that is, when someone requested this, I right away connected to the story and I knew I had to do it right away. I was getting so many um, impressions and downloads from spirit. So I just knew that I had to, I had to, uh, do this one. So that is what I got you guys on the Sauter family case. Um, this case is crazy and I will see you guys in my next video, like subscribe, share and all that stuff. And I can't wait to have you guys back and talk to you guys again in my next video. Bye everybody.